Our scripture this morning is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and then 12 through 19. Um, I'll preach on verses 7 through 11 next week. Um, prefer to speak on suffering once and then the end times once with respect to chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for passions but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. It has been said before, rightly so, I think, that Christianity is not about what we do, but about how we respond to what has been done for us. It certainly involves action, but that first action is God's pursuit of us. By faith, we respond to God's seeking and rescuing of us. When Peter says, since, And therefore, he is both encouraging people to a daily reflection on what Christ did for them and reminding them of what he explained in chapters 1 and 2, namely the gospel. That we're loved because of the work of Christ, drawn in as his children and then given a role in the kingdom that we are specifically called to do. Peter's expecting us to remember all that. And he says that we have ceased from sin Interesting. I don't know about you, but I was convicted during the confession of a sin from about 9.47 a.m. That's in between our two services. So I can confidently say that I have not ceased from sin. What does Peter mean? He's making a point, I believe, similar to the one the Apostle Paul makes in Romans chapter 6, if you'd like to study more on um, this. But his point is that your core motivation has changed if you are a follower of Christ. This is under the umbrella of a theological idea from the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is the New Covenant, which is not based upon our actions, but is the Lord seeking, pursuing us, and giving us a new heart. And if you're thinking to yourself, you know, my core motivations are actually still pretty bad. The fact that that would even come to mind, I would call evidence of your core motivations beginning to change. It is swift, and probably preceded our knowledge of it, but God's grace comes before our knowledge of it, and it certainly comes before our willingness to respond to it and our ability to respond to it. There has been a fundamental shift, if you call Jesus Lord, towards life and away from death because of the new heart that he has given you. We still experience idolatry as Christians. We still ask things to deliver the way only God can We are still grieved. We still see and experience sin indirectly and directly all around us. And yet, we have ceased from sin in the sense that we have been given a new heart and it will not be forever with us and it will not dominate us. I read a book last year called Preaching is Reminding and 
I didn't love the book, but I love the thesis of the book. I love the theme of the book because it applies to me and to you. Many of you are very familiar with the Bible. Many of you are very easy, easily able to summarize the gospel to your own mind and heart. And it is still good and worthwhile to be a remembrancer. That's my favorite thing about the book, that word. To be a remembrancer amongst your friends and to your own heart of the gospel of God. When Peter says, arm yourself to think the way that Christ did, he's reminding you to remind your friends who are followers of Christ and yourself of the good news of Jesus. This overlaps, I think, with Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul talks about other ways to arm ourselves in a world that is beautiful and noble and also cursed and racked with disease and sin. I believe we arm ourselves by reminding our friends of the good news of Jesus. And it's actually an important part of corporate worship. If you have no role in corporate worship, I want to say it the other way, there's no such thing as no role in corporate worship because you're a remembrancer. And the friends in the building and spiritually connected to us through the Holy Spirit's universal claim on the church, are encouraged right now by your presence as a follower of Christ. Jumping ahead to verse 12, this is what I want you to be encouraged by in arming ourselves. Arm yourself with the knowledge that because of Jesus' work, and the Holy Spirit's indwelling of you who call him Lord, you are known as beloved. Not only beloved, but also strong and have a role. But I think we often semi and subconsciously turn our following of Jesus into one of works, which is the very opposite of the gospel. And perhaps the quickest antidote to a theology of works is because of the work of Christ, you are beloved. Remember that and remind your neighbors of that. feels awkward in 2020 and yet we're called to do it and that is how we arm ourselves with the living argument of the gospel. I first heard someone describe the gospel that way 15 years ago, a pastor in New York City named Tim Keller who heard it from another pastor in England named Reverend Lucas. The gospel is a living and alive part of you that speaks peace and truth to your mind and to your heart and to your very being. Peter here is contrasting living as though there were no hope with living as though there were hope. In verse three he says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensualities, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He's not saying that all Gentiles do that. He's making a double point. He's saying many Gentiles who have no, and and by Gentile, all he meant was a non-God follower. Gentiles who have no hope go to these other things for their hope. And Christians ought not to be characterized by these things. These things are sin, but if we fall into them, we're not uh, outside of God's favor, and we seek to avoid these things. His point is, those without hope worship the things of this world because they do not know otherwise. And followers of Jesus are to be characterized as living in the opposite fashion. Yesterday I played uh, golf with a number of guys that I play basketball with when humans used to play basketball with each other. And three years ago when I received the invite, there was a long list of rules that involved lots of alcohol consumption. And I emailed the the head and I said, I can't, I'd love to play golf with you guys. I can't do this. I actually, and I actually can't. If I shared with you the rules, I would expire if I did what they direct. And so I was given a religious exemption, religious exemption to the morning hoops golf rules. Then yesterday when my team won, it was, we were perhaps noticed for uh, me violating that, but I'm given this religious exception. It was talked about after the game. And what's interesting to me is a whole bunch of things. One, one of the guys on my team who I don't think is a follower of Christ did not participate either, though he was not granted a religious exception. I'm not sure how that works in terms of the bylaws. My point is, 
Christians' lives are to look different. And that doesn't mean we don't enjoy mundane gifts like alcohol. It does mean we don't over-enjoy them. The word passion here would be an over-desire. Asking that to deliver in, certain, in a certain way to our being, to our mind, to put us fully at rest or to feel outside of ourselves or to escape. Christians have no need for that. And the irony of that is we're then better able to enjoy the mundane gifts. Not all. First beer that I had in my life, I was in my 20s because there's some history of it in my family and I wanted to be very, very careful. I was writing the sermon this week and um, I copy it from a small notebook onto a larger notebook and sometimes I type some of it and this is a way of engaging my brain with it. And a couple of weeks ago, somebody told me that I'm too vague and uh, they were not speaking about me speaking about alcohol, but I decided to not be vague just for a minute. I'm sure you can handle this. I think shots are stupid. If you like the taste of whiskey, why are you drinking it that fast? I get concerned about vodka. I'll be honest, some of you like vodka in a mixed drink, and I'm not calling that sin. But in 20 years of ministry, it has often been um, a dangerous addition to someone's life. How is that for clear? I'm not saying those things are sin. I am saying that as we approach the text, which says these are good gifts, mundane gifts, and they're not to be over-enjoyed or sought after. And Peter's writing this in verse 3, and then in verse 6, he's preaching in a way that is, in writing in a way that is, I think, harder for us to, to grapple with compared to alcohol. Like alcohol, you either drink it or we don't. And then in verse 6, he says, for this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, and by that he means not yet followers of Christ. He doesn't mean biologically deceased. That though judged in the flesh the, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Most of the time, followers of Jesus and those who are not followers of Jesus stumble into the things that Peter listens to, lists in verse three is because they are not alive in the spirit. And here's why. The main reason I experience with Christians is they don't think it's possible. And they've either um, attempted to be gripped by the grace of Jesus in such a way that they're alive to the spirit or they never really have. They do not believe that there is freedom the way that Peter talks about here. They don't believe that they can cease from sin as a core motivation. They don't believe that they can be alive to the Spirit, which means a constant knowledge that you're loved and a constant interest in following him as he describes life because he knows what is best for us and we do not. Friend, Do you believe life in the Spirit is possible? I desperately, desperately, desperately hope that you do. Because it is. It involves prayer. It involves worship and community and faithful presence. The, the, the phrases we utilize as a vision statement are not simply to guide our church and its finances and in, in the places where we go out into the world attempting to... Um, act like Christians there. It's also a guide to human flourishing. How do you experience life in the Spirit? One of the ways is worship. This moment here is a filling moment. You know, like it doesn't feel very filling. That's a conversation, both with God and with friends. You want to be really daring? Take verse 3 from chapter 4 and discuss it with a couple of trusted friends. Right? That doesn't sound clever. Let me read verse 3. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. If you have a group of four or five friends and they're trusted, talk about your history with those things or lack thereof. That's how, part of how we grow. And the other part of our vision is faithful presence. One thing that is troubling me about COVID, a lot of things are troubling me about COVID. One thing I'm going to mention about COVID is because of the way that it restricts um, our time and our ways of being in the world, I see more people, including myself, 
on social media, and that in and of itself doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? In that way. What bothers me is we're, we're spending time scrolling instead of doing our work. And by work, I mean way beyond what you do for a living, vocationally. I mean your work as a follower of Jesus in the family, in the neighborhood, and with the skills and gifts and circumstances of your life, acting like a follower of Christ. And there's not a simple answer to that. And I'm not saying you just need to reduce your screen time by 15%. But I am saying that one of the things that we must consider as followers of Christ in a very challenging moment is how to continue to go about our work. Because you have a role, beloved, you have a role in the kingdom. You are an agent of his grace and mercy and peace. And your imperfections are part of how you do grace, mercy, and peace and not be a hypocrite. We arm ourselves with the living argument of the gospel as he prepares us for suffering. One of the many themes of the New Testament that comes up throughout, uh, Jesus talked about it, Paul talks about it, James talks about it, and here Peter talks about it, is to be prepared to suffer. And one thing that has troubled me uh, probably since I was about 19 is my suffering is almost never cinematic in the sense of suffering as a follower of Christ. You know, it'll happen in these tiny moments because of the way our country works, because of the way Western thought works, because at times Christianity has been in power, which is usually when we do the, which is usually when we get the worst rap and we deserve it because we're not, that's not what we're supposed to be about. Anyway, I think our suffering is not very cinematic. I think when people malign us, make fun of us, um, judge us, it's either silent or it's mumbling and then they move on. And I expected it to not be that way, you know? I got to college on a Thursday, University of Missouri in Columbia, walked into my fraternity house room for the first time. There were 17 guys playing quarters, which is a drinking game. And Jason Waterman introduced himself. He said, I'm Jason. I said, I'm Matt. And he said, do you uh, want a beer? And I said, I don't drink. And he said, do you uh, want a Coke? And I was very pleased by that. He and I are still friends, and I appreciated that. But... In the moment where these 17 guys are looking at me, this is a little bit the kind of Christian I was at the time, but also what I expected because of the way this was preached was like, when I said I didn't want to drink, it was going to be like, aha, you know, impressive, dynamic, questions everywhere, how could that be? Tell me about your hope. Instead it was, do you want a Coke? And I think that's as indicative of America as anything else, and yet we are still to hear Peter not writing to us, but writing for us to expect suffering. And Peter mentions, by the way, in verse 15, suffering that you cause yourself is not what I'm talking about. That's, he says it sort of backwards in the way that we would say it now in verse 15, but if you harm yourself, you can still call that a grief, but we're not, that's not suffering like this. Suffering is when we're mocked. When people reject us. I think one of the ways that Christians suffer in the 21st century is, unlike those uh, with a different hope, our affection for our neighbors grows, and yet our neighbors still resist the love of God. Our affection for our neighbors grow, and they still experience disease and death, and that grieves us. In verse 19, Peter says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is Peter preaching. This is Peter encouraging his listeners to stay the course. You might miss a promotion by acting like a follower of Christ. You might get a promotion by acting like a follower of Christ. It depends on your boss and your company, right? You might be the only one on your team who's truthful all the time without being aggressive with the truth. You know that you can do that, right? But you might miss a promotion also because there's a system and you could manipulate it because you're intelligent, but you don't. You choose not to. And someone notices and either figures it out or asks you, why you didn't manipulate that situation the way that you could have. And you might get to talk about your Christian faith for just a moment 
and it won't be very cinematic. And what Peter is saying is that that's actually a blessing to your life. I wrote in my notes here, you might look like a political outsider. I actually think you must, as a follower of Jesus, look like a political outsider. Because if you're, if you're towards the right and you're a follower of Jesus, you're probably really generous to the poor, and that's good. If you're on the left, you're going to care about some moral matters more than a typical democratic platform. I believe as followers of Christ who are suffering for among other reasons because our political and cultural systems are so challenging at best, if not violently sinful, we will look like outsiders. You might lose friends. I have a friend who left his wife and children last year and he wants me to only talk with him about his new life. I can't do it. And I do not know what to do. And I believe this is a small form of suffering because of how much I care about his family. It's not like calling Jesus Lord and being put into an arena like some of Peter's followers would experience. It's not like calling Jesus Lord in many, many parts of the world today and being sent to a camp or being murdered. But it does cause me pain. And and what I'm attempting to preach to you is to not be surprised when you grieve death and disease, which are part of the effects of sin and the fall. Don't be surprised. When work is challenging, no surprise there for a number of reasons. Peter prepares us for suffering and blessing. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. We receive this by faith. Blessing doesn't feel a certain way. Blessing doesn't forever imprint on our minds in a way that we can always rely upon. We receive this by faith in the same way that we receive our salvation by faith. That when we suffer, and we don't even know all the times that we suffer for Christ, because especially in this part of the world, it's challenging to know when that's happening and when it's not happening. Peter calls it a blessing. Those small seeming moments where you acted like a follower of Jesus and others either reviled you in their head or out loud or you paid for it, it was a blessing. It is, will be interwoven to the kingdom story of your life to be revealed partially in heaven and then fully at Jesus' return. All of those moments were a blessing in your place of business, with your extended family, at home, in this community, in the, in the community that you live in. And I want to give you one, one uh, clue into how the Lord utilizes you, uh, the role that he has given you in those places. Um, for me, it happened, uh, I, I gained this clarity about 12, 13 years ago when I was ordained, because I realized that I wanted to be everybody's pastor. Um, pretty ambitious, youthful, unwise, sounds exhausting now, you know. But at the time, I was full of excitement and joy, and I had had good mentoring from other pastors, and I was so wise, you know. You're supposed to laugh. I wasn't that wise. There you go. Thank you. It's important to laugh at pastor's jokes so they don't get thrown off. <laughs> you know that well. Yeah. And I was with my family, and some of them are followers of Christ. When I was with one part of the family, and I realized that I was trying to pastor one member of the family instead of be her brother. And through that process, and now I brother her, not pastor her. She asks me a question, I'll certainly answer it. But um, through that, I, I came to grips with I'm not everybody's pastor, which now I'm like, thank God. Like, you people are enough. You're lovely. I'm so glad to pastor you, but that's enough. In other people's lives, I am a pastor, so that might be interesting to them. And then in a whole bunch of other people's lives, I'm a guy who believes weird things. These 20 guys that I played golf with yesterday, I'm going to say three or four of them are followers of Christ, and the rest of them are like, that's Matt. He gets the religious exemption on shots after birdies. 
because I think shots are dumb if you didn't catch that earlier in the sermon. (laughs) What's your role? Your role is an indication, and by role I mean mean the, the one that you would agree with that the other person would understand. Your role in that person's life is a guide to your role as a follower of Christ in their life. Always involving prayer, but it doesn't need to transcend or pretend you don't have that role with your sibling, with your boss, with your employee, with your child, with your parent. We begin there and then we receive the Lord's guidance on those things specifically. And by his grace, we become better friends with those people. Friendship is a very colloquial word. It's a very oft-used word. And in the kingdom, it's powerful. It is a bigger word than evangelism. It's a more important factor to your relationships than your techniques. Verse 19, I'm going to read it again. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is Peter encouraging these seven groups of churches. This is Peter encouraging you to entrust your soul to Christ. And I believe here he's not talking about initially. He's talking about it in an ongoing fashion. And so if you have thought this sermon was, eh, it's fine, you can still take verse 19 and you can pray it today. If the sermon was no good, all the more reason. Take verse 19 and pray it. Jesus, I trust you. Help you to trust. Help. Gosh, I did that at 9 o'clock too. Help me. Help you. Jesus, I trust you. Help me to trust you more fully. If the sermon was great, thank you. Help me, Jesus, to trust you more fully. I trust you. Help me to trust you more fully. I believe we honor Peter's teaching to us, inspired by the Holy Scripture, when we pray this way and trust the Holy Spirit as it does its work inside of us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, for those that are not yet trusting you, we ask that they would consider your gospel and its claims. We ask that they might ask a friend to talk about their good and honest questions. We ask that they would talk. I ask that they would speak with you about their questions. And Jesus, for those of us that trust you, help us to trust you more fully. Amen.